Hi, and uh, welcome back to the Retro Gem podcast. Today, I got uh, two guests with me. I have uh, Jack Barry and Liam Grimes. How are we doing? Hello. 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 So, got these uh, got these lovely gentlemen here to talk about a uh, a new book they're going to put out. It's called uh, Sundown, an other world fairy tale. That's the first time hear it out loud. That's the first time someone said it that isn't us. <laughs> 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 oh, wow. So t- tell us a bit about it. Um, Leon, why don't you start with oh, you know, synopsis or something? You, Leon's so much better at um, explaining what it is. I'm a, I'm not very articulate when it comes to telling it. Anyway, go on. Uh, okay, so I mean, essentially, like plot wise, you know, it's um, there's a, it's it's a fancy story. There's a there's a brother and a sister. Um, Living it up in the world of their mom, you know, it's it's a woodland uh, paradise, let let's say. Um, but their equilibrium is, of course, thrown into disarray um, as their mom gets stolen from them, and they uh, have to venture outside of their uh, little safe little bubble, um, and yeah, go and adventure on uh, in search of their mom, uh, which I feel like is you know analogous for. Um, uh, children growing up and entering the the world outside and this uh, this kind of absurdist scary reality that the world is and um all of a sudden yeah all of a sudden you don't have your familial unit your uh your guide or whatever and you're kind of just lost out there trying to trying to figure it out and that's kind of what i feel like the story kind of guides itself towards Jack. Yeah, definitely yeah i think um aside from like the more fantastical themes and uh aesthetics we definitely wanted to like capture that coming of age experience that we went through in that you know you get you know the day comes you know whether you like it or not that all of a sudden you're on your own and there's all these issues to confront you know it is we all grew up we all came of age fairly recently some more than others um but from a while ago yeah <laughs> leon about 20 years <laughs> back <laughs> um but uh but yeah we, we 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 love it and we think it's really good don't we which is hard to say about all right. something you make it's it's decent yeah it's sort of like Hansel and Gretel vibes you talk about like a brother and a sister going out in the woods yeah yeah I've not actually heard that comparison before but yeah it is very Hansel and Gretel um uh what what inspirations did we take Leon I can't I don't even know what oh I feel like this is primarily your bag really a lot of my uh sure a lot of my stuff was anime (laughs) (laughs) fairs um I think uh not that you didn't ask the question, Jethro. I'm sorry. Um, I think it, it draws from a lot of sort of uh, sort of fairy stories that I was growing up with um, in sort of the early two thousands. Uh, so like Spider Wick. Don't know if you've ever read that. That was great. Made a film about it. Film was not very good. Um, what else? Like Narnia, things like that. You know, children burst out into the world or a new world and have to like, grow up quick. Uh, always wanted my own version of that. Now we have it. Mm-hmm. It's cool. I'm not sure if I can ask this without asking you to spoil it. But what sort of um, adversities uh, do do they uh, come across? Go on, Leon. I mean, uh, can we talk about when they end up uh, in essentially like a capitalist kind of slave horsing sort of thing? Can we mention that? Are you talking to me? Yeah, mate. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, 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 like that. That's a. I like that section of the book where they're kind of wrapped up in the, the rat race of it all. Yeah, yeah. No, let let it out, man. Um, let it out. I I led you. You you uh. Okay, you pick it up. Pick it up. Um. Oh, there's. I mean, there's plenty of adversity. It's a very. Uh, we. I don't know why. We just really wanted the world to be super bleak and weird and like Dali esque and kind of. Elden Ringy, I guess you say, like very, it's very Dark Soulsy, like to look at. Um, but there's this bit that Leon's referencing, and um, 
in the later, in the latter half, where they're like enslaved uh, in this city. And it's all very um, sort of Dickensian. And uh, um, what do I have that's interesting to say about it? Um, they learn a lot of lessons that are, like they get into like gambling debt uh, and as therefore become enslaved. And that we, we started mentioning gambling in the book. And we were like, oh no, this isn't age appropriate. And then we're like, yeah, but it ends with them being enslaved. I think that's an okay thing to say. Gambling's not good, kids. <laughs> <laughs> um, what else happens to them, Leon? Lots of people die. Lots of people, uh, there's a lot of moral sort of... Um, moral turmoil between their their actions where they realize that um their missions morality becomes quite blurred and sort of uh, not very straightforward which i love that in a story when you when you when your character is a, you know approaching a goal and you know it's wrong and they know it's wrong but it's what they want and it's what they go for um i love that stuff you know, like in The Last of Us, where like Joel, like kills all the nurses and stuff, uh, and takes Ellie away, and uh, and of course we're rooting for him because we want to get, him, you know, it's Ellie. You can't kill Ellie, and then uh, but then he's like dooming the whole world. It's a bit like that, you know. It's like a double-edged sword kind of morality thing. Um, it's, it's pretty much exactly that, actually. So if you if you've seen The Last of Us, uh, <laughs> don't even bother. <laughs> <laughs> No, um, it's uh, what what one thing I also uh, really like about uh, the way uh, the story's being told anyway is um, it's 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 kind of subversive in the sense of um, we're not just building toward you know like how a lot of fantasies and stuff they're kind of just building towards uh, some big war between the dark orcs and the the, the new kids or whatever like um, it's. Uh, I feel I feel like the the stuff that they do on their adventure, whilst it's still kind of a like a a Campbellian kind of story, it's um, they their struggles are quite unique to that story. Like for instance, them ending up in in slavery and uh, and just just working to get out of slavery. It's like a I don't know. It just it feels a little different to. We wanted to tell something that wasn't just another Lord of the Rings, uh, which is something that you kind of said in your initial pitch. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, um yeah the point was to use cliches um because all the best fairy tales do follow that structure but we didn't want to do something that was you know recognizable to the masses like because everything nowadays is lord of the rings isn't it really like if it's fantasy it's orcs and bow and arrows and swords and castles you know there's a i guess there's a there's a couple that do it uniquely but um and that, and that stuff has a place so i, I don't want to like show, yeah. like uh you know, oh, yeah. Me and Leon, we love a bit D and D, love a bit sword and ball. Love D and D, love it. But, um, but now we're all about OG stories, bro. I mean, there's not much more we can say, really, because um, well, simply because it's not out yet, and <laughs> no one's read it, <laughs> and I'm not even sure they'd be bothered here and let's talk about it if they had read it. Maybe they would. I don't know. But um, I think uh, yeah, shut up, Jack. That's what I'm thinking. Sorry, go on. So, um, I don't know. Like, as soon as I heard you two were making a children's book, I thought, okay, that's a bit. It's a bit different from uh, what you what you do tend to tend to go for. Like, um, because uh, at first, children orientated content, I wouldn't say you two definitely felt like fit into that or what? anything. <laughs> 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 And you also, I mainly know of your work um, in film, more than anything, because uh, I mean, Jack, you work in uh, in film, don't you? And I do, I do, to my own despair. <laughs> no, it's great. Fifty jobs have just cancelled, calling for. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow, Jack, no, no. Oh, grateful swine. Um, no, yeah, um, it's the first, I think, the first proper serious um, attempt at uh, a, a novel that either of us made. Um, 
we were um i think the, the main thing we said in, in the pitch for the for the kickstarter that we raised um was that the film industry especially as like a newcomer or, or as a creative was uh, we felt we found ourselves fairly disillusioned by the whole thing uh, especially working in it day to day you can see how much of an old boys network it is and how sort of um, painfully restrictive it is to to get anything made seriously unless you're someone you know either from you know a film or a film orientated background you've gone to like NFTS for example or your I don't know your hot shit um, whereas we were like when's the last time you made something creative without having to worry about um everything that comes with getting it made like funding and um you know the bureaucracy of chasing agents and publishers and or like in the case of film like you've written a script trying to get a producer attached and going after a company and trying to find the money and find the cast la 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 that just is losing its charm for me day by day and that's why we did it i think leon isn't it really um because we had it planned to be a film. It was planned to be, um, I think the reason we started this in the first place was like, a que someone asked me a question like, um, how realistic do you think it would be to make a no budget fantasy feature film? Uh, with, the, with the sort of uh, conception of shooting it like five short films, five like sort of like mid budget short films over the case of like five, six years and then stitching them together into like an hour and you know 30 or something like that and that's where me and leon started wasn't it like i remember calling you when i was on yeah. set for this job actually um munich the edge of war on netflix check it out it's really good <laughs> you know, all the locations on it they're really good um i called leon and was like mate let's just do it let's just do let's just not listen to the whole i'll oh, make something low budget and socially realistic so that you can shoot it let's just go all out and make something really out there and we had an image and then just did it. And it wasn't until later that it became a book because we were like, oh, I just hate the idea of having to spend thousands and thousands and thousands on something that's not really gonna look any good. Like a high, fa high fantasy is a, is a short film and it's us, like it's not like we know any like world-class DPs or producers or anything. Yeah make something like that happen anyway i'm talking uh, to I, think, I think we were um i think we were uh discussing before as well like um the the difference between like writing a script and a, and a book um like when you have a script um it's not satisfying because it's just the blueprint of sort of a larger of a larger product whereas like the when you're writing a book like the, the prose is there like that is the that is the medium that you're consuming and being entertained by and that's so much more um, accessible to be able to create than, as you, as you say, like have to go through all of the industry trying to pull this favor, trying to pay pay this amount, pay this amount. Um, so yeah, writing the book has been way more liberating, knowing that you can just the whole world is um, as accessible as like what you can think of, essentially. Yeah. And but it's then yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, no, I know. I'm just going to answer that, saying that it's realized and it's in its final form. You know? Yeah. Which is which is so much like nicer than looking at a at, at a script like uh you know there's, there's there's no prose in a script it's just like they did this they did that um, you get some you get you some know. beautiful scripts but um, oh yeah sorry not to talk bad on <laughs> yeah. but it's but it's not like prose it's um it's not quite like prose I wouldn't like sit up reading scripts at night I don't think maybe some people would um but that's not why I love writing I don't think I love writing for the for the bits in between. Where you get to just like play around with emotions and senses, you know. Sorry, what were you saying, Leon? I was just going to say about how um, uh, you know, tackling it as a book kind of mitigates the the issue of um costs and all that kind of stuff and having to um uh, organize getting everything made to 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 create the book. Um, however, now we come into the the issue of the. That's why we've now got the Kickstarter to to publish the book. Uh, it, there, there is actually some costs that uh, go into it. 
that um, I don't know whether that was a leading question or, or, or whether that was on your uh, questions or not, Jeffro. Are Either you uh, comfortable talking yeah. about that? Because uh, I've for me personally i've never published a book so it'd be interesting for me just to know what goes into publishing it sure man i mean um there's 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 obviously a lot of different ways of doing it um there was tra- there's traditional publishing obviously which is the going down the route of chasing an agent looking for an agent getting them to represent you and then approaching a publishing house and trying to get them to publish it um I'm really simplifying things there, um, to my knowledge. Um, but that process can take years and years of just like the book is written, the book is finished, try and sell it. You know, as your first, you need to have written it. Whereas, you know, if you were if it was your second, maybe you'd get an advance and then it's like write it by this time. But for your first book, it would just take so long. And um so for for this anyway. Me and Leon, we're both, we're not exactly careerists. We're not exactly uh, uh, entrepreneurial, I should say. Um, oh. I'm just, I mean, speaking for myself, I don't know about Leon, he might have something in the works. Yeah, I've got this one startup, but I, I'm not comfortable <laughs> talking about it on this <laughs> podcast. Uh, <laughs> um, next one. But then obviously there's um, self-publishing, which is what we're doing. And um, we're using... Amazon service KDP, which is like a really accessible um, self-publishing service where you keep uh, 70% of the royalties for every book that you sell and they sort of make them to order. Um, and you just have to provide everything, you know, in, in terms of the book. And then they print everything for you and take a cut for selling it. Um, the cut's more than, more than we thought it would be. Um, I think if we sold a book for like 12 quid, we'd get about like three uh, like two pound fifty back or something like that but uh to be fair it's the same with traditional authors uh, sorry traditional uh, publishers so um, but it, there's no upfront fee is there um no you know it's free to do with with amazon uh, some of them do some of some of them have fees involved um there's ingram spark which is a bit more high end and kind of gives you a bit more creative freedom with the with the format like uh they do like hard covers with like dust covers and little inscriptions and gold leaf printed onto the front and all that kind of stuff. Um, but we were happy with KDP um, just from results that we've seen online. I think the, the plan is to um, go traditional at some point. But uh, again, what's the rush? We're really proud of this thing. And we didn't do it for any other sake than it was something to do. Uh, but then we made it really good, and we were like, "Oh shit, we better, we better show people this." I, I'm going to keep saying it's really good, and then everyone's going to read it <laughs> <laughs> and tear it a new one. Oh man, don't don't knock it. Don't as knock they it. should, as they should. No, absolutely, Wesley, Wesley, please. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, you know I'm going to get a call from Wes. Like, hey. Uh... What is that? <laughs> what, what, <laughs> what have you no, done? I love you guys, but uh, don't ever work with me artistically again. <laughs> and you're not allowed on 20 FCT. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> uh, so also looking at uh, uh got, got your Kickstarter up here. You've also got some like uh, illustration compilations that, as, as well as using words you're also using pictures and mm. well if you say picture tells a thousand words you're using that sort of thing do you, do you want to talk more about that absolutely uh mm. leon looked like you're gasping for it go on mate oh no i just i just love you know the, the combination of, of of text and image in the medium of a book like we're, we you know we're breaking new ground here but um it's uh <laughs> no, no, uh, uh the kong uh, the, the the illustrations are done uh, by Kong. Uh, he was a fantastic, fantastic artist um, that we have the luxury of being able to be in contact with. He is in, um, he's incredibly talented. Kong Nguyen, check him out. Yeah. I think I'm pronouncing that right, Nguyen. Um, here's his Instagram. Yeah, <laughs> you do, you do my police. Uh, um, yeah. I'll, I'll send a load of, uh, of the illustrations if you want to put them up. But the viewers to enjoy. 
Um, because they're so good, they're better than the book. Let's be real. And uh, he's like so, um, so good at uh, taking like bits of text and just immediately understanding what they're supposed to look like as well. Like, uh, just from what we've seen, that it feels it's just brought the book to life, hasn't it? Really, yeah. We've had very little notes to give back on him, um, prop some, but like so little because his his uh, his imagination is brilliant and. I mean, a children's books, it's about fairies and other weird stuff. It's got to have illustrations. Come on, man. Mm-hmm. It's got to have pretty pictures that tell the story. And uh, and it does. And it looks so good. We're really happy with it. So it reminds me of, oh, I don't know if you guys remember this. Um, it's a book about a black cat that goes into this haunted house. Well, I'm not sure if it's haunted, but it looks haunted. It's like the typical gothic thing. And as uh, they find this house, you go up to the door, you go inside it, and feather and feather. I think I do remember this. Is there? Is it like there's a mouse at the end? Yes. It's a dark, dark house and a dark, dark, dark dark house. Yeah, that's it. That's it. I thought of that as soon as you said cat. Damn. Yeah, Mm. I loved that book when I was a kid. Oh, my God. It's all come flooding back now. That's a great book. Do you you remember this? Is this like a shared? Oh no! Hey, I've not, not thought of that. A reader, but sorry, <laughs> <laughs> I've not thought of that book since I was about four. Jethro, you just you've just like I felt the neuron click in my oh. head. <laughs> I, I couldn't think of the name, so we we got there together. We did. We did. <laughs> <laughs> um, just another note on the illustrations that um, oh, what was it? Oh, come on, Barry. Um, oh yeah, um, the fact that it was like a film initially, um kind of made us want to put illustrations in it because like the visual medium is just as important really like we're not like dis- discrediting like film or anything by going through the option of a book but um just seeing it i think really helps it's a very visual world it's it's very high concept we wanted to we wanted to see it because we spent so long so long like um year like a year actually just like compiling images from artists that we like and mm. music that we like, that we thought fit the vibe. And we've got this massive document of all just like things that make sense in that world. Like um, we took a lot from like Dali, obviously for like the landscapes, but this one artist that we really took massive influence from was uh, this artist called Ivan Seal. And he does, he's a sort of Mancunian uh, artist who worked a lot with the caretaker do you remember that album uh, a couple of years ago everywhere at the end of time and it was that um, oh do you remember it was, yeah. that, it was that kind of like six hour uh study of dementia and when i listened to that i remember seeing you post about it on facebook to be fair jethro um i, I listened to it a few days ago actually oh really mm-hmm. mad i listen to it all the time when i'm writing because it's like it sums up this world so well is and their journey in that it, it starts, they start in a very familiar place that's something's only slightly off. And then by the end of their journey, the world is unrecognizable as even a world, isn't it? Like, it's just mm-hmm. like, they've forgotten everything. Um, just like the music of the caretaker does. And then, uh, and so we, I did like a deep dive of him and over lockdown and got really into his stuff. And, um, was fascinated by the um, the way that Ivan Seal paints the same way that he makes music. It kind of gives you that, uh, the empathy or the, like the eye into what it is to forget something. Um, like there are images of like plant pots with flowers in them, but it's clearly not that. It, it was that once to you maybe, but now it's like, what am I looking at? It's like, I don't know, super profound. And we really wanted to um, emulate that some way in the visuals of this book. And I think we've done it. I think we've done it. Hmm. To an extent. Is really, it in... Uh, let us know in the comments. <laughs> oh, God. Is it in the same way of uh, liminal spaces? Yeah, yeah. That um, In that sort of back rooms vibe. Is that what you mean? Mm, yeah. There, the... There's definitely a bit of that. I think... Um, that was a bit after our time when we started writing, but I, I do love that sort of um, that eeriness. 
Um, and there is a bit of it in the book, to be fair, like these spaces that seem uncanny. You know, um, Leon, do you want to talk more about our art? Uh, give me a question and I will answer it. <laughs> How about that? What do you think of liminal spaces there? Just, just, just to throw a, a, a vague one out there. Of liminal spaces. Um, I watched a I watched a video on them um, that uh, kind of went into the sort of uh, I suppose they're in a superposition of uh, being kind of uh, kind of creepy but also familiar, right? Because they're uh, a lot of the liminal space images we see are made up of things that you'd only see, um, like say you're in hotels or airports and stuff. They're they're just rooms that are supposed to be um, passed through. You're not supposed to stay in them, right? um which uh let's let's see uh if we can like relate that to the book i suppose we could say that um you know life itself is a liminal space and the journey that you go on right because uh you're, you're you're kind of just passing through um and yeah you can reside there for a little bit gain some familiarity but but the end is death and it, it's it's coming for you <laughs> that's why we try to tell the kids at home <laughs> yeah yeah so read, read the book, kids. Let's know how it goes. <laughs> what's your uh, Jeffro? What was like? What's uh? Do you have any like favorite childhood books? Uh, what kind of stood out for you Ooh. about them? Oh, I'm trying to do my question. market research. I want to capture what the kids <laughs> need. Uh, thing is, I I was never a kid to look at all the popular stuff i was always like looking for that that weird uh maybe not weird but something just um there was a bit off the beaten track which i think explains a lot in my later life um you are different from the other girls <laughs> <laughs> um i don't know i'm trying to think um dark dark uh Dark Dark House. Oh, that that's that. I'm still thinking about that. That's just oh, bro, all flooding back. That was great. That book it was so oh. so scary, so weird. Because so did did you get that was, thing? Uh, sorry, no, you. Uh, but Jack, uh, did did you get that thing where you're you're in infant school, or whatever? You got sat down, they read you like I don't know three pages of the book, and it's like right now you. Gonna have to wait till tomorrow to know what happens next. And yeah. oh. oh killed me. Killed me. And what did we read at school? In in primary school. I think we did the Hobbit. Uh that was a massive one in like year four or five. And we were all just glued to the teacher for that. Oh, school used to be great, man. We gave it <laughs> no respect in time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you don't know what you have till it's gone. Absolutely. Oh, answer to your question. Um Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Oh yeah. Oh, okay. There's yeah. this one thing that stands out to me in the second book, I think. It's um the restaurant at the end of the universe, and there's this cow that's been genetically engineer engineered to a talk and be want to be eaten. <laughs> and okay. uh I offered a uh offered dent. Oh <laughs> not off the dent. What what what's his name? Oh it, it, Oh, half a dense Batman, isn't it? Um, <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, I've not read it to be fair. The, the, the guy in, uh, I Batman think it's all. Character. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, the, well, the the main character, Arthur. I think his name's Arthur. I don't know. It's been such a long time since I've, uh, since I've read it, but there's one thing that stood out to me. And there's this conversation where he's absolutely horrified that this is Cal coming up to him and asking, um, asking him to eat him. And he's like, why would you do this? It's like, why would you want to eat a cow that doesn't want to be eaten? <laughs> and it's like, you know yeah. what, that, that that's a good that's a good point. <laughs> would you would you eat the cow that offered itself to you? Would you rather eat a cow that didn't want to die? No, I I I I eat the I'd eat the cow if it offered it to, offered itself to me. Says uh, the vegan. Speaking as a, a vegan, yes. Uh, <laughs> no, consenting meat, dude. I've got nothing wrong with like I've got <laughs> nothing wrong with the taste of meat. It tastes fucking awesome. If someone wants to die, get in my stomach, you know. But, um, <laughs> so I'm 
sorry if I swore and I can't. I, I don't know if. Uh, no, no, you're fine. You're fine. Cut that. Cut that. Uh, are you are you advocating cannibalism there? Uh, ooh. touchy subject. I think yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. so, so we have euthanasia, right? Um, if someone is wanting to die um, consensually, um, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, there's probably a few reasons why it's probably not okay, but um, just as the objective scenario as it is as it is by itself, I think consenting meat is fine to eat. By the right. book, kids. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's illegal in the UK. I think it's oh, that defiling a corpse is illegal, <laughs> but eating meat, human meat, isn't. Okay. You're going to clip this, aren't you? You're going to. Yep. <laughs> Jack and Leon come to talk about their children book and legal cannibalism. <laughs> How much de defilation of a corpse, like, could you get away with before it's illegal? Uh, I'm, I'm not like... a lawyer. Let's uh... go into the details, Leon. Yeah. Yeah. yeah let's... <laughs> what base can you get to with a corpse? <laughs> this is not legal advice. <laughs> Christ. Asking for a friend, bro. Um, yeah, research. The uh, then again, a lot of a lot of these, uh, just going back to kids' stories or, or things like that. <laughs> a lot of these yeah. stories, like Hansel and Gretel, they ate the witch. Super dark stuff. Yeah, yeah, but that's for kids, isn't it? All the Brothers Grimm stuff is, yeah, notoriously like really uh, dark and has been sort of neutered by Disney and modern adaptations. Um, but it's because, like, at their at their core, their lessons more than anything. There were adults tell the children it as a as a means of learning, um, and I guess when these stories were getting written, you didn't. I mean, the social lessons weren't really important. It was here's not here's how not to die in Germany. Don't go walking into the woods because you'll get eaten by a fucking bear, and so they tell them there's a witch out there, and they don't go into the woods and they stay alive. You know. Mm -hmm. We're doing the same thing with this book. <laughs> uh, yeah, legit, legit. Well, yeah, actually, I laughed because it's like a out of this world kind of thing. But I think, uh, I think the lessons we we did want to like a lot of the things that are in the book as sort of uh, morals are things that either me or Leon resonated with, having grown up looking back at childhood, or wish we had learned mm -hmm. earlier in life. Um, yeah, that's what I think about hmm. life. Do you have anything to add to that, Leon? Uh, no, I agree. Like, um, it's kind of yeah, the the, the crux of the uh, motivation behind getting, you know, uh, telling the story as it as it is is uh, yeah, as a, as a vehicle for education for. The lessons we do want to kind of impart I, or like um i feel like i'm currently at a place in my, in my life where I, I could definitely have learned some of the lessons that uh opal and russ the, the two characters do go through um i think i'm still in my rust era at the moment mm -hmm. got, got to uh rust for for context is the younger brother of opal he's about like theoretically like nine um and he his kind of arc revolves around fear and uh and being looked after and being cared for um his kind of arc takes him down a path of like learning to be independent and kind of facing fears and uh taking charge and initiative um whereas opal who is the older sister theoretically 12 ish 13 something like that um, has kind of the opposite where she is very hardy and unafraid from the start and has to learn the opposite in where she has to um, uh, I'm going off topic Leon what does Opal learn no well like um, Opal's more um, be, I suppose being the older sister she's um, more used to being taking charge and stuff and feeling like um i guess feeling like the biggest fish 
in the pond. And then, you know, when she comes out into this real world and stuff, um, I suppose what she has to learn is kind of um, learning the, the world will, will trick you. Uh, we'll be a bit bigger than you sometimes. And it's like kind of uh, kind of learning to trust other people um, and hoping that like, because the world's much easier when you've got people helping you out. And I think that's kind of... Uh, she 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 uh i i don't want to reveal too much i don't want to reveal too much but i think uh, yeah a, a big a big part of her like learning is that um say it uh, i say is there like any spoilers just whack them out man yeah no i i well i just want to see because like one, one of the things she ends up doing is becoming like a big uh kind of leader in a in our community and stuff but it but it takes her relying it takes her uh being able to trust the other members of a community to be able to form this like a uh, to be able to form this community they have in the first place um and she you know she starts off so stubborn and kind of uh she'd have never she'd have never had this newfound family had she had still been in this kind of idea that she was the only one competent to do anything um uh, and it really i don't know it's, it's it's beautiful to see that they get to to have this new family together mm -hmm. uh, do yeah. i have any, any light i'm gonna I'm gonna you go are, to the lab. <laughs> you are, yeah, you are disappearing a little bit. I'll be right set, back, isn't it? Um, off the back of that, yeah, like um, learning to sort of rely on other people was something that I didn't learn until like my twenties, I think, really, like properly, anyway. Um, because especially as a man, um, society or whatever. Uh, masculinity dictates that your issues are um, dealable and that airing anything isn't really uh, isn't really valid and your problem should be swallowed and you shouldn't have to lean on anyone else but um, I think that's that's uh, a decaying philosophy nowadays thankfully but still like young boys will hurt and and the same for girls as well obviously opal's a girl in this scenario but um uh learning to be vulnerable is something that is has been majorly important to my life and um is an underrated lesson in my opinion uh, especially in a society where like i don't know going back to like the topic you talked about the other week was like social media and the pressures of of the current social um field um there's a lot to deal with that's a lot to deal with in life yeah that's it i mean from one perspective that how uh, when do we ever grow up because a lot of us think oh yeah when uh when I'm eighteen or the night before my eighteenth birthday, I'm gonna go to bed, get my software update, and I'm gonna be <laughs> an adult. But obviously, it doesn't work like that. Um, and then I don't know about you guys, but like as I get on, it's like, yeah, I I wasn't really that mature when I was eighteen, or I wasn't that mature when I was twenty, and you start to realize at points where you think that okay, yeah, I'm a I've grown up, you realize, hold on, I've grown up even more. So, yeah, I think um, something that I didn't really learn until I was of age is that experiences mature you rather than like numbers specifically. I feel like it's different for everyone because everyone's faced with that time when they're going to have to be an adult and there's no choice. And how you respond to that defines, you know, defines your course. And being an adult, being mature, being of age, it's kind of hard to define nowadays anyway, because what does it, you could mean physically or you could mean like mentally, but then everyone's constantly growing mentally. So um, I don't, I wouldn't really know how to define it. I'd like to think that I'm of age and that I'm of, that I am mature, that I'm an adult, but I'm sure in four years time, I'm going to look back on me now and think you knew nothing. Um, it's a hard one. I mean, certainly at 18, my God, I barely remember it. <laughs> like, what the fuck was I doing? 
I don't even know. I was a kid, obviously, I was a kid. Um, by no means an adult, but, but yeah, it's an interesting idea. Mm. Yeah, I feel like uh, maturity. It's a uh, it's, it's a man made concept, man. Like uh, like there's there's no there's no grounded set rules. It's like this is this is who you are as an adult now. This this is what kids behave like. Like, dude, I'm I'm 28 years old. I, I recently got a, a an avatar like last Airbender face tattoo. I don't know if you can see that. But like <laughs> like like I'm you know you know what I mean. Like um, no, sick. I I still often uh think of myself as as a kid like you know i'm like oh i'm i'm, I'm the boy I'm, I'm a boy right but just, how like how old can you get before that starts um you like because I, I i sincerely believe it when i say i'm still a boy but there's going to be a certain point where you know i uh i, I can't be like a 35 year old boy the, the at what point do you do you make the switch i i don't know but maybe maybe if you read this book you'll uh you'll yeah. find out <laughs> Well, I think the answer to that, Leon, is that, like I said earlier, experiences really make it. I mean, I've got a lot of friends who've had children and who were yeah. who were not off the rails, but certainly pretty rowdy and wild and teenager, you know, like to do drugs and drink and go crazy and all that and not really take too much care of any responsibility. But then that child comes along and you've got an unavoidable responsibility that you have to you have to fix up for and they do and luckily like the friends that i know that have fixed up are completely different people now and that is like the switch like or the, the closest thing i've seen to the switch from boy to man is responsibility and experience like and so in the book our two main characters get it they get sort of this experience which is the journey of trying to save their mother which is ironically the thing that would keep them as a child, you know, um, that's what that's what grows them up, and that was so cool. And we definitely didn't find that out on accident <laughs> <laughs> three quarters of the way through writing the book. <laughs> um, what about sort of like uh, role models, be it like real or fictional? Like, um, like as kids, we may look at stuff like oh yeah we like uh explosions pew pew lasers and all that <laughs> but then let's look at say doctor who that for nearly 60 years has been something that's been uh well to begin with it's supposed to be like educating kids about like history but then it became uh, a, sci a science fiction adventure about this alien character, this eccentric character, getting out of situations, not uh, not with his fist, not with a gun, but with his mind, hmm. and that that character has been um, a role model, a role model for for generations now. So I, I find that interesting. That we like pew pew uh, lasers. Um, but we also gravitate towards characters that don't use their fists. Absolutely. There was one time where um, uh, I think the 10th Doctor did use an orange to uh, uh, hit the switch <laughs> on that alien spaceship and make him fall to his death. So uh, I see I your point now. I do see your point, Jeffro. <laughs> <laughs> That's, yeah, it's interesting. I never really, I mean... I've, I've not watched Doctor Who in quite some time, but I used to love it. Um, but I never, I never realised it was like an educational thing at first. It makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, when did they, when did they start becoming sci-fi? Like, what, what point did it switch over? I mean, it was always like sci-fi, but the time travel element was to go to different periods of time, and yeah. uh, like during the William Hartnell era, it was uh, to go to these different periods of time and just explore history. Like, uh, this is what this part of history was like. This is what this part of history was like. And then you had other things like, say, the Daleks, which, again, sort of was more like a, a, a sci-fi concept thing, which mm. is, is supposed to fit within the BBC's remit to uh, educate and entertain, which I'd say it definitely did. But it's it leaned more towards entertainment than education, yeah. as I went with um, Patrick Troughton. 
it's it's interesting that you say um it is a good point that you made earlier that uh that, that, that modern media sort of does prioritize some sort of violence in in in, in you know their, their regular programming so it's simply because it's like entertaining to look at and it will get the most eyes um i'm trying to think of anyone like role model wise that uh that isn't like violent i know you said gordon ramsay but <laughs> <laughs> but then he's pretty violent um yeah um it's 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 funny you say that because like one thing we didn't want to have was like swords and shields and that you know that tolkien-esque thing in our story and so opal and russ like they get into problems but they're not fighters ever really are they like literally no i think they do they fight physically but it's not it's that's not in any part point of their personality I will say, I will say on like um just on the point of um violence in fiction though I feel like it's um uh it's never really about the violence that is I mean it, it it's it's quite entertaining and visceral to see and stuff but like um what people care about in those stories is the is the the conflicts of ideals right and like the violence is like a I suppose just a very easy vehicle to kind of very easily see one of those ideals like um uh what's the word like uh succeeding over over the other right like we like we like seeing those clashes like in dragon ball z they're fighting all the time but it doesn't it doesn't matter if there's no there's no backstory uh uh to it um and i i think that's why violence is so prevalent in media because we like seeing people like see people's ideals confront and win um but it's but it, but but yeah, it's 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 fun to try and find ways to do that that don't entail fists and guns and stuff, which I think we do in the book. Yeah, uh, fa fairly well. To go to back to uh, agree. To go back to the Last of Us, um, that's that's got a really interesting kind of a perspective on violence because obviously it's a video game and it's a shooter video game, so you need violence really. But um, I think the second one, uh, especially, uh, kind of takes that into moral perspective a little bit, and you are confronted with the consequences of all this death, um, and and yet, like Leon said, nevertheless, um, it's about love, and it's about family, and it's about caring for people, and it's about relationships at its core and that's why people love it it's because these characters are so strong and so um so good together um violence is just that clickbait that goes on the thumbnail you know I, I, I saw you recently um did a did a video uh about um video games making people violent and stuff uh, jeff or at least the, uh... the argument against that right um, but I, I think I, it's, it's interesting what you said about like you know the um, uh, obviously acts of violence and stuff have uh, long since predated video video ga video games and whatnot. Um, it's just a it's a core part of of humanity. I think uh, um, our relationship with that more kind of carnal carnal instinct. Uh, well, yeah, how, how would we get safer. food? How yeah. do we get food? Yeah, right, right. We had to kill an animal. Get it from the grass, mate, you bloody meat eating. Uh. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll take you to my favorite tree. Get some pine cones. Uh, but also, nature is, is sometimes quite violent, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Uh, it is. I don't Everything, know, like... everything, everything's chaos, man. There's no rules. There's no rules, really. It's just everything is just like a cell. And that cell is trying to divide and divide and conquer area and absorb other cells. Like it's the same everywhere. Going um, back to childhood <laughs> or things you see as a child. Uh -huh. um, I think it was on Channel 5, but there was this um, document. It's like a documentary about meerkats, 
but I voiced it like it was uh, Big Brother. <laughs> Sweet, okay. Um, is that where sort of like Alan comes from? Uh, Alan, Steve. <laughs> Well, I'm I'm not sure. I'm honestly I'm a bit fuzzy with that, but no one gets the meme. Oh, that was huge ten years ago. <laughs> no, no, yeah, the little chipmunk thing, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Hello. <laughs> Sorry, what, what what were you saying there? Oh, oh it's a documentary that um it had like oh yeah uh, Alice has uh, wandered off from the pack and is exploring on her own, but little does she know that there's a snake uh, just. So from by nearer that that sort of thing. Um, uh, Does Alice I, get hurt? Hmm? Does Alice get messed up by a snake? No. See, here I am. Here I am falling for the for the for the age old ploy. I want to. I want to watch that show now. I want to know I if Alice gets though. messed up by a snake. We'll be I, good. I don't... See the snake just wrap around Alice's neck. And like... <laughs> <laughs> but I make her did die in it. Sorry, we've got a dead meerkat. Let's and go and watch it right now. I, and, and as a kid, I was like, "Oh, oh!" I, I was expecting a happy ending, and that didn't happen. And I, I was, yeah, yeah. yeah uh, that was, oh, that was a moment right there. Yeah, man. It's a, yeah. It's the, I'm sure we've all got that jarring moment where mortality becomes like a real thing to you for the first time you know um it's easy to see it in nature documentaries but i'm trying to think what else is in. even just in films you know you see someone die it's like oh my god he's actually dead forever that's a real thing or in real life you know um that's another thing we're doing in the book <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some, back in shamelessly some death some death there is some death uh because i think like an, another thing that is important for kids to learn about is that is is how is how to how to deal with death and how to confront death and what it looks like. It's it's a uh, uh, what's it what's his name the lad who does the Midnight Gospel on Netflix. Oh um, um yeah no I think I can't remember his name Pendleton Wards mate anyway uh, he has a fantastic episode where he interviews a mortician and talks about death from a someone that's like really experienced with it and sort of has like a nuanced perspective of it and that's really cool um go check it out it's it's interesting um i'm not going to try and paraphrase any right now because i'm I'm, you think uh, um sorry uh that was me i was gonna say do you think um like uh, experiencing uh, death and stuff through through fiction. Um, do you think that is a inadequate like a uh, preparer for uh, real loss? Um, and I, and I guess like to further extend that question, um, like just the vicarious experiences we have through film and media. Do you think that like because we because we extreme such exp- uh, because we experience such extreme scenarios through fiction um does that then perhaps lessen um our our intensity of feeling um in our everyday today do you know what i mean like because because our lives are not as extreme as the fiction that we read right but like that they're they're always in some intense ass like in eastenders they're always in some like intense ass like really i don't know really really intense uh situation uh I, I just don't know whether we, if we we're watching that all the time, whether it dulls our experience to it, and maybe the same to to death. Yeah, I mean, I'd say so. I don't know about you, Jethro. Um, I don't, I don't know about death because obviously, when that does come around the first time, it is so visceral and life changing. Mm-hmm. Um, but certainly with like the uh, uh, the structure and love and violence and the adversity that things go through in shows. It, I've certainly felt almost lacking at times, especially in my like adolescence of structure and what am I doing? What's the story? Why, like, why am I not on some sort of clear path and why am I not experiencing the things the way that, you know, these shows and 
films would depict in books. Um, like I, uh, I've been rewatching Normal People recently. Uh, a fantastic BBC show. It's a, like a romance thing that was very relatable for our generation in the UK. Um, but I keep finding myself kind of looking at this um, ideal romanticized version of love um, and seeing even through its ups and downs how it is really fucking dramatic and really intense and really beautiful and when you compare that to real life if you know either with relationships or even just like your day-to-day -day life it's easy I think to um, feel blue about the lack of uh, excitement day to day I think that's mm -hmm. one thing that film and TV have done uh, that's negative but I guess that's each each their own really either of you have any experience with that kind of feeling um sort of like so say you're watching like a long running TV series and uh, the main character you really like dies at the end of season four and then you rewatch it, and the character's back again. Uh, you you know they're gonna die, but you still experience them in a similar way that you experienced them before. Yeah. So I don't know. For for me, there's there's a bit of a disconnect between death and real life, and death in media. Like you look at it in media, you can always rewind, and there there are. are not not literally, but you can like go back, rewatch it, maybe skip the season four finale so you don't experience that again. <laughs> and then you carry on. Um I don't know, I I, I find it a little bit different personally. No, oh for sure, for sure. Just find it difficult to to put in, put into words. So oh, this is, this is interesting, I'm gonna have to think about that. Maybe if you like a specific character in the book, you should only read up to page like two hundred and five, and then just is that the actual. Uh, it's probably around there. <laughs> yeah. probably around there. Uh, <laughs> there's one main death in the book that's like big, and in your face. Um, but it's so not yeah. who you think. It's not who you think. It's not who you think. The answer may shock you. <laughs> uh, so if I could just uh, divert this more into like writing, maybe not for this project or maybe for other projects you've uh, you've worked on, but when you've collaborated with another writer on something, um, and you have two like different uh like different ideas on how this one thing should be done, how do you reckon? How, how do you reconcile that? Like fight to the death. Uh, yeah. Uh, Coliseum time. <laughs> yeah. I've died at least four times over the course of this book. <laughs> um, have, have there been any major instances we've we've run into like a we've clashed disagreement? We've definitely clashed. I can't yeah, um, to... I can't think of any specifics, but I do remember like the process of that. Um and it's 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 what it's all about, man. It's what it's all about. It's it's really like um the way I look at it is that like, you know, you're the parents and the, the thing is the baby and you both want what's best for it. And you both mm -hmm. think you know what's best for it. And it's just about, um, it really depends on the issue, but you just got to have it out. You just got to have it out. Um, I've worked with writers before on, on creative projects and we've disagreed and it's been like, okay, fight your corner. Tell me why you think yours is better than mine, why your idea is better than mine. And, uh, and you go at it, but you've got to be, you've got to be open-minded. You've got it. You can't, obviously you're fighting for the good of the book, not for the good of, or the story or whatever it is, not the good of your idea. You're not trying to win. Mm -hmm. You're trying to figure it out. You figure out what's best for it. Mm -hmm. And that's what me and Leon have been doing when we meet up is just like sitting in a room with a huge whiteboard and just throwing shit up and being like, why does this work? Why does it need to be here? And if we fight, then great. I want Leon to disprove me because that would mean that the story can be better than I originally thought. You know? Yeah. And because no one's no one's no one's perfect. Everyone's like 
no one's got like the perfect way to tell a story unless you would you know you've got your structures and that but there's there's beauty in variation you know no, I think I, it's like like you said um because you're you're fighting for the good of the book and you you know that's like both your goal um that made it a lot easier for me to to speak up with any kind of disagreements and stuff because I, I knew it wasn't going to be a case of uh yeah I'm not like fighting with someone's ego uh we're just you say yeah fight your corner say out all of your argument points and then and then then yeah then then, then you figure out like who's got who's got it's not necessarily like who's got the best points or whatever like, like that but it's just like oh this yeah this makes sense for the book um, strange, which yeah. which uh the, the name the name is probably where we found the most uh oh yeah we found like, <laughs> for ages flashing on that um we had like we had like we we got to a point where we had the whiteboard um with a list of possible names and we just like just dash them out as we were like uh, yeah, like, why is this wrong? Explain to me why you think this should be the name. And if you yeah. haven't got a good enough answer, <laughs> it's gone. There was about 10 or 15 in the end, I think. <laughs> we went through so many different variations. Um, Would you like to go through because... some of those? For uh, the names? Ooh, yeah. Ooh. Oh, well, God. do you want to give them the first one? I feel, I feel like the first one's a good... We nearly settled on the first one, but it was too wordy. Um, the first name was Alone Together at the Edge of All Things. Um, and that took fucking ages to get to as it is. Um, <laughs> but it was too lang. Um it's like every yeah. uh, everything at the end. I've Yeah. Every <laughs> yeah, that, that one. It was similar, yeah. Let me have a look. I have the list on it somewhere. Um I thought everywhere, everything everywhere all at once. Ugh, that, that that's a long name, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, to be fair, but it's that three works. times fast. <laughs> it, it worked. We had oh bloody hell! I've got the list here. Let me see. Um, the bug collector. That was one that I was fighting for, but Leon didn't want it. I oh, wasn't having it, mate. wasn't having it at all. Your reason. Uh, the, 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 there's reason. There's reason to it for sure. But um, yeah. The, the, as with ev every name on the list, they all had their reasons. But uh, I think we just yeah whittled it down to the most concise. Yeah. I think also like on the point of like collaboration, um, because this is a book and because we were working it from day dot, we had so long to get comfortable with each other and so many sessions. I mean, we must have met up 50 times at least to talk about this and to hash oh, over, it. over, surely over that. Definitely. Um, yeah. And so it got to a point where, I mean, in the first couple of sessions, we were probably like, you know, if the other person says something that isn't that great, you're like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah that's but great is, yeah yeah but, yeah but then by the end of it we were just like no nah, i don't like that i don't know like that and here's why um J jack's got this great like a uh, face uh like because because he, he he will still try and be nice about it like like he'll, I'll, I'll say something and he'll look out the window and he'll, <laughs> and he'll look at me like uh <laughs> yeah but what if <laughs> And I I know, I, but it's great. It's great. You, you you work each other out, and you start you start to understand like what what works for each other. And and I think uh, like I think we we got into a nice groove where we the books the books nice man. It <laughs> is nice. nice. It is nice. And I can see, like collaboration is so important to me. Like definitely like not this wouldn't be, we wouldn't be on this conversation without that first phone call that I made to Leon. Like hey, I want you to help me with this. I want I want to do this with you. If we, if I never made that call, like I wouldn't have written this thing. Um, How long ago was that? Uh, I found the picture the other day. It was like, what was it? February twenty twenty, I think it was. No, October twenty twenty, I think it was. Sounds about right. Yeah. On, yeah, it was on Munich. It would have been. So long, long time ago. Two and a half years in the making. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but it excites me that um. A writing can be so solitary and so lonely and there's so many times where I've been writing in a public place and I've just been miserable because everyone else is having fun and I'm here like on oh my fucking own doing this but it really excites me for uh you know the idea of like writers rooms and workshops and stuff like that you know a lot of television and films are written with big rooms of people you know in that sort of vein and I understand why now because like it needs to be said out loud, doesn't it? Things need to get yeah. out there and people need to 
debate it. Every single point needs debating. I've worked on things before where you you weren't quite you were taking things too personally and weren't quite as uh as detached emotionally and that can get quite messy and then end up with a bad project at the end of the day. You end up both yes manning each other into oblivion and you come out with something that's weak because it's not been critiqued properly. Mm. It's never personal. It's never personal. It's a machine, you know, you need to make it work. I want to um I want to shout out um uh credit to to Jack's like solitary efforts as well though. Um just cuz uh whilst it has been like a collaboration um J Jack has been like like heavy lifting uh just cuz he, he he's the author he's been he's been writing it. So what what we do is we we you know we meet up we, we speak we discuss stories we discuss ideas then Jack goes away and actually actually makes the book like actually writes it down and you know paints the prose and all that kind of stuff and um you know bros put in like you know a thousand words a day kind of the the, the graph the graph that it's taken for it to get to this point like how big's the book now what how many pages like uh we, i think right now we don't have all the illustrations it's like 478 i think we're at like ninety thousand words dude i am never writing that much in my life over, <laughs> over anything <laughs> like <laughs> like I've I've really got to yeah really got to give credit to like this book even being a thing, uh, it's just down to just how motivated Jack's been to to get this done, um and and you know and then, you know he's he's living up in he's living up in Bristol he drives down to Derby just to have these meetups and stuff and it's it's been, you know it's been a sorry it's an ambulance um yeah no it's been it's been good it's been it's been a good uh it's been great it's been really inspiring uh, time being a part yeah. of this. It has been great, man. The one thing I wanted to shout out as well, um, on top of the fact that Leon has been invaluable and a fantastic creative mind to help me through every single barrier that got in the way. Um, on the topic of barriers, like um, one thing I really wanted to talk about here with you today, Jethro, is because because I feel so strongly about it, it was. Um, it's something you mentioned in your last one where sort of like social media and the internet is becoming more of a growing problem. Um, before I started writing this book, um, I was fully addicted to like, I'd, I'd like to say YouTube, mainly just YouTube, um, sort of like mid post lockdown, spending like, like no joke, at least five hours a day, just sitting there, just doing that this is the t before the time of shorts as well so it's even worse now but um mm. it wasn't until like uh just off the cuff one day my missus was like let's put a lock on it and like you know give, give yourself 20 20 minutes a day and i was like yeah i'll give it a try and i don't know the code and like slowly like my dopamine receptors began to fill up over the over the next weeks and I began to actually like focus on things and actually like read again and actually just like do things that take like the most minimal effort but when you are drained of dopamine by things like YouTube and social media and you know addictive sort of uh media and uh, things are just undoable and I couldn't have focused on writing all this stuff at all sitting down making the effort to do any of that with the modern distractions that everybody faces like if i didn't cut them out like wouldn't have done it wouldn't have done it i think it's a massive problem that everyone's facing and i recommend you all do it click off this video now stop watching youtube <laughs> <laughs> dislike the video <laughs> write a book well, you've been watching this for like 40 minutes now go and do some <laughs> Some press ups. I see seven tabs open. You don't need that many tabs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. No, that's, that's what you mean. That like I've I've had a bit of a cleanse myself as well, and found the first thing is I've been sleeping a lot better. Like <laughs> instead of getting like the short bursts of sleep, I've been getting like eight hours, maybe even more, and it's like. Nice. What, what's going on here like this, <laughs> this is strange <laughs> i don't usually get this amount of sleep but yeah i started to feel feel better because of it um 
it's mad. Like like Wes said in the previous episode, like there are, you know, we don't. The internet is so new, and we're in its baby stage. We don't know what long term effects of all of these kind of attention grabbing media faculties will have on you know brain chemistry and mm -hmm. i think like certainly like our generation certainly but the next generation even more so are in for a real adhd overhaul um, i had a thought since recording that episode though just uh i tried to float this by you guys mm -hmm. uh when the printing press was invented, everyone thought it was uh, going to be a detriment because people aren't going to be writing things down anymore. Um, when the whiteboards were invented, or um, e even when it comes to like with things like the internet, or yeah, you know, when an invention happens and then people say people aren't going to be using the thing that they were using before, mm -hmm. so therefore that's going to be a detriment to them. And I sort of have a feeling that something new comes on, it changes us. Um, I, I'm starting to think that the new technologies aren't the problem, like the common factor is us. Oh, for sure. I mean, yeah, I, I really hope you're right. <laughs> I really hope that, like, that we change, like, to 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 accompany and to accommodate it. Um. I think that personally, anyway, I don't know about you, Leon, or you, Jethro, but uh, I feel like this one's different. You know, I know what you mean. Like the the kind of new facets, everyone's got that kind of juvenile where they're like, like, ah, oh, kids these days reading their 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 novels till come past twilight. They'll be rotting their brains reading too many books and then, you know, watching television too long. And then, you know, I feel like this one is different because the ones before weren't like monetizing your attention uh, with algorithms and with neurology. That's, that's what's scary is that it's taking the power out of our hands, I think, anyway. What about television? Because it would uh, monetize that through ads. They want to keep watching this. Uh, stay tuned after this break. For sure, yeah. They get money yeah. through that. It's definitely a smaller version. But um, I feel like to focus on one thing for, say, it's an hour episode, even half an hour episode, still engaging, it's still uh, um, it's still content. No, you, you, you're probably right. Still, you, you're with, probably with TV, right. I feel like there's like a it's it's like a prototype with, with, with TV. There's still a, um you're still watching kind of narratives for the most part. There's still some kind of um uh work being done um by your thoughts to to put the narrative together, right, and to get some kind of satisfaction. Whereas like these these shorts and stuff now, you know, you 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 could just you could watch just you you can just watch so many videos that are just nothing. And it's so like accessible, so constant all of the time, uh, complete brain rot. Like I, 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 I end the day now. Like I'm, I'm fully in the whole YouTube addictive, like slave brain uh, hole. Right. Like that's that that that's me. And I, I end the day with such a headache, man. Like I'm just I, like I've I've got this throbbing pain because all all I've done is just like let my brain rot on on crap all day like let's plays and stuff and it's 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 funny i enjoy the stuff i'm watching but um there's no there's no effort involved which i, I think is the big problem uh, you know prior prior pre uh printing press you, you're reading you're still putting some effort in this is this is nothing man yeah that's I assuming think... you could read back then yeah it's, yeah yeah for sure i think uh to answer your question jethro i'd say television is definitely like not innocent in this in this realm um, I think it's definitely the forefather of of this problem. Mm. But like Leon says, there is, I mean, it's scary to think that we're in a world where television and watching television isn't the most lazy thing you can do. Like 
watching TV it was almost feels kind of cultural nowadays, like putting something on that isn't like some bloody Mr. Beast YouTube short or <laughs> some you laugh, you lose compilation. Um, isn't that weird? Isn't that bizarre? God, we're geriatric. <sighs> yeah, I guess with like TV, you could you could almost still pretend pretend that it's like a social activity, right? Like you could sit around with your family and watch the TV together, even even though it's like a I suppose it is a cheap substitute for actually socializing with your family. Um, the YouTube culture, like you can't you can't really sit down and uh, you can show someone a YouTube video, but you can't really sit around for half an hour just watching like the same way you'd watch TV. You can like yeah, pull up some Mr. Beast video. I assume would be like, hey, hey, mom and dad, you want to watch like Mr. Beast give this homeless person twenty million dollars? I don't know. Do people like that? I don't really watch it. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I think it's, I think it's the length as well that does it for me. If the, uh, if the average kid is watching shorts as their primary piece of media, then. Anything that's over, I don't know how long shorts are. Are they like 20 seconds, something like that? They have to be under one minute. Under one minute. Okay. So, say so that's their, say they're consuming shorts constantly, then the cap on their attention realistically will be one minute. Like, and that's for things that they're enjoying, let alone something that takes effort. That's was, what's worrying. To me. I was watching something the other day that was um, talking about how, um, presidents used to have like political arguments um publicly right um and like you know the public would go out and watch these people two people just talk at each other for like seven hours and that would be like the you know they, they weren't like running for president or anything it was just like politics was that important that like people would go and see points being discussed publicly um but people would people don't have the attention for that now like for, even for politics you're interested in like to watch what a discussion on it for seven hours i just i couldn't imagine that yeah anything any anything for seven hours no but it gets yeah. boiled down to a slogan like politics you got your brexit means brexit which is like your your slogan and your mouthful is your, is your little spoon of sugar um, yeah agree with me and yeah you say that people are People would nod or people would shake their head. And it, it's like a short shorthand. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, what what does it mean? Like, it can mean whatever you want it to be. Yeah, absolutely. What does it mean to you, Jeffra? Does Brexit mean Brexit? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I shouldn't have brought that up. Let's red pill this podcast. Let's go. <laughs> Uh, to tie it back to the book, <laughs> Sorry. Go on. to tie it back to the book, I think um, that's an, this. This is another reason that we've kind of chosen this medium is that uh, reading's good for you, and I like this story. It's got these little chunky sections that are consumable in small bites. <laughs> Some call them chapters, I guess you say, <laughs> um, but. Um, I can't remember my point. I'm sorry. That's all right. So, would you like after this is out, after your baby's out in the world? Um, would you write another book? Yeah, absolutely. I think so. Um, is that about you, Leon? Do you want to start that? Well, I mean, uh, this. This uh, process has inspired me to start like writing a little short story. I don't know. I don't know how serious it is, but um, I I I don't really usually write prose. Um, so it's just been nice to uh flex that muscle, as it were. It's it's really easy to fall out of. I've not written since school. It's weird getting back into it. It is but weird. I love writing. Love writing. I mean, you could probably talk more about the experience of writing what it does for you. I suppose me, me? yeah 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 you um, got a lot more practice with it i mean i think that's that's the key word is practice i think um ideally in an ideal world not that this is what i'm going to do but i'd have written this book with you and we'd have put it to bed and then we'd write 10 more 
and we try and publish the 11th. Like, mm -hmm. that's how I think, that's how I think like the brain box writers do it, is that they are constantly writing all the time and then we'll sort of uh, find one within that space. There you go. Okay, I think I did it with this one. I think I landed it. I think, I, I think this is good enough. Like Wes, for example, Where's the Thomas G? One of my favorite writers out there. Um, Where's me, Thomas G? He's constantly writing. He's constantly making music. He's constantly just crafting. He's just a fucking wordsmith, that boy. And um, and you can see the development through his work. And mm. that's one thing that I want to do more than anything is just keep writing for the exercise of it. And like like Leon said, it's a muscle. It really is a it really is a muscle. Like yeah, and yeah, there's no way to get better other than just keep doing it, you know. That's so, if someone's listening and they're a writer, they got writer's block. What would you recommend that they do to unblock that? I wouldn't wish it upon anyone. It's the worst <laughs> thing ever. It's worse than having, no, I'm not going to say it. <laughs> it's worse than a lot of things. Um, I I suffered with it for like, like two and a half years. I didn't write anything. And every day I was thinking about writing and I didn't write anything. It was awful. It was really awful. Um, one thing I'd recommend is that it's, um, that brain health is, physical health, like you need to be drinking water, you need to be exercising because, and you need to be eating the right food, otherwise your mind just won't work the way that you want it to. You won't be able to, you know, you, you don't see it when you're, when you're, you know, kind of in an unhealthy lifestyle, but when you get out of that, you realize how much clearer things are. Um, secondly, again, I can only speak from personal experience, but uh, walking is really good for me um, with no music. I love music. I love walking and running to music, but, uh, running and walking is really good on your own. It just comes to you. I don't know why. It just comes to you when you're slowly releasing endorphins out in the wild, in the wilderness. You know, out in the air. The best ideas I've ever had have come that way. Um, yeah, I think that's the two main things I'd say for me. Um, I guess thirdly is like um, just read, just read, just consume media. Just see what, see what, just go back to your roots, see what you love, read and watch things that you love and think what, what story you actually want to say. What things in your life do you feel are worthy of sharing with other people? Or well, not even worthy, just like um, look inside yourself. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. That's what I'd say. What about you, Leon? <laughs> I don't have any life advice for anyone to follow. Bad Sorry, guys. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's uh, probably about time for you. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to like, kill the podcast. <laughs> I just don't have any life advice. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, that, that, that goes that, down to that, uh, that old idiom of um, a full speaks to say something a wise man doesn't until he has something to I, I don't know uh, yeah, it, it, it's, know. Off, it's off there it's off there it was a, it was a wise problem <laughs> no you're right you're right maybe I shouldn't have said anything yeah, <laughs> yeah Jack you look like a massive fool and I look like a <laughs> Don't listen oh. to me, kids. <laughs> no, no, this is a podcast. I like, imagine yeah, having a podcast where no one talks. <laughs> true, just sit and think with each other. Dude, I'm you're really that. you're really thinking outside the box with that one, Jeffro. <laughs> <laughs> How do we monetize this? Mm. Oh, I saw a tweet that um Brent Spiner uh said that is that like, oh I completely uh, ripped it off him and uh Joe Ryan uh responded saying oh yeah I'll, I'll be in it's like you'll be my first guest i'm uh 
very interested in hearing all the things you don't have to say. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> uh, on on that note, uh, unless there's anything uh, you guys want to add, uh, uh, check out the book. Sundown. Yes. Another uh, word for it, uh, out mid May. Check out the Kickstarter as well if anyone wants to. Uh, link below. Link below. If anybody, that would be awesome. Uh, we are so poor and uh, we want to get this book out. It would be really cool. It will help us distribute it. We're looking to get it if we meet our goal into like 2,000 houses in the first week, which would be really sick. That would be really sick because we've worked on it for so long. And uh, and you'll love it. You will love it. Just give it a go. It's like broccoli. Just You will like it and it's good for you. Uh, yeah. Hello, everyone. At home. <laughs> Where can people find you guys? Uh, you can... You've probably got my number if you're watching this. Let's be real. <laughs> Actually, no, that's a lie. <laughs> that sounded oh, oh, I won't you. You. oh, fuck me. Um, I'm on Instagram, Jack Jack underscore lock96. Follow the book, Sundown Novel, on uh, Instagram. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Thanks, man. Okay, and yourself, Lo? Uh Yeah, you can uh, find me at n underscore tell underscore quest and on instagram and tell quest D D forever baby um and yeah i suppose you, you can find my youtube channel as well just me on crimes um yeah that's me you can find me in my in my flat <laughs> I'll, I'll be in YouTube. bristol if anyone wants to hang out yeah I'll say hello uh, well, <laughs> don't all rush at once. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you very much, guys, for coming on. I appreciate it. Uh, Thanks for having us, man. The... Yeah, so it's been a pleasure, mate. Thank you very much. Like, like mine in the uh, the gems of conversation there. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, check check the guys. Guy. <laughs> it's a bunch of miners having gems. <laughs> Check these guys out, check out the book, and uh, yeah, subscribe, like, and uh, see you later.